Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the special meeting of the Board of Education to order. We'll stand at the 11 of pledge by Ms. Resch. I'm one. I'm 
I'm sure we have at least a hundred that we want to be on this board. At least to give our ideas about what we need to do for the district and how to make this district work. In three years, we're going to run out of money. According to all the numbers I've seen, all the, the funds and everything's going to be out. So hopefully, we can get this district back the basics and get to greatness. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stiller. I will respond to um, a few things. First of all, the district cannot host a Meet the Candidates forum. There are other groups out there in the community that can do that. So, um, you know, perhaps we could speak to some of the other groups that are, can legally host one of those forums so that you have that opportunity. Um, we, the board has heard loud and clear all of the suggestions that have come in in regards to how to do this budget process differently in the next year. And we certainly will be looking into all of those suggestions to do just that and to continue to try to be inclusive of the community. Um, in response to your first comment about discussion and, um, you know, will tonight be the night? Um, well, first of all, all of our discussions on this budget have been in public, so you have heard where people stand on, on many of the different items that have come up for discussion, because we have done them publicly. Um, due to ongoing contract negotiations, we will not be taking final consensus and having final discussion on the last three remaining items from the agenda that got moved over from last week. We cannot jeopardize our negotiations that are ongoing. The board has not even been briefed as a whole at this point as to what happened in last week's negotiations. So this evening, that discussion will not take place because the board does need to be briefed on what happened last week and there is potential for ongoing negotiations. So that discussion will take place tomorrow evening at the special meeting. I will announce this again at the end of this meeting but that meeting is now going to be changed to 6 p.m. here at the NFA Auditorium as opposed to 6.30 p.m. to allow a full hour before the uh, board's workshop begins for that final consensus and for discussion around those last items in regards to the reductions that still remain in this year's budget, proposed budget. Ms. Robin Guzman. Hello. I would like to submit some more petitions along with letters of support from Assemblyman Frank Spartatos and Newburgh City's Mayor with all five City Council members. They share the concerns that we have been voicing for the last two months. As Mr. Maldonado stated at your March meeting, no moss. Whether deliberately or inadvertently, the district has been closing schools in Newburgh City one by one until there are only two elementary options left in the city where almost half of our entire student population lives. This denies the predominantly poor African American and Latino families choice and access by forcing them to bus their children outside of the city. 70% of our students at Horizons are from the city. 80% of our students get free reduced lunch, and 83% of our students are students of color. In addition, as Assemblyman Spartato says, closing Horizons will most assuredly have detrimental consequences on our children, the immediate neighborhood, and broadly set back the progress of every person who is working fervently to better the work. At Horizons, every single student is an IB student. IB is a standard bearer for rigor and a proven program to close the achievement gap. We are realizing the promise of the IB program, but this progress will be stamped out. And the investments of time as well as taxpayer funds squandered if Horizons is closed. We didn't get a special invitation, but we have been showing up at board meetings to make our case since February. We are here for what is best for our children, our community, our district. We do not want to see these painful cuts take place at the sacrifice of any of our children in the district. We are neighbors and friends. We do not want to fight over dwindling resources. 
I implore you again to do long-term strategic planning and create a community budget advisory committee so we can work together. More immediately, my request was for you to discuss the budget proposals under consideration tonight. <coughs> Rigorous debate, grappling with difficult decisions, and transparency are paramount to a healthy process. Carefully couched statements and one-way communication does not garner trust, respect, and understanding that is necessary for community buy-in. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Guzma. Ms. Michelle Ryder. My comments tonight are more personal than over the last couple of months. I moved to Newburgh in 2003 when my daughter was two and I was pregnant with my son. My husband and his two brothers were born and raised in Longville, all attended Longville School, and went on to graduate from Yale Dartmouth in Cornell. We first entered the lottery system in 2005 when we were preparing our daughter to enter kindergarten. We were advised by friends to send our children to private schools. Being out of support of the public school, we did not listen. Naively, we assumed that the magnet system was really a magnet system and the lottery is really a lottery. As a working mother with ever-changing child care and a daughter who would be four years old for most half of, almost half of her kindergarten experience, our first preference at the time was foster time, mostly because it was close to home. We soon learned that there was only one open position in that lottery for a white child among the incoming kindergartners at Foster Town School, which would have been our name for the school. We were advised by many people to call in any favors or contacts we had to get our child into Foster Town or Baltimore. We personally know people who went to great lengths to get their children into suburban schools. The idea of manipulating an already broken system did not sit well with us, so we didn't listen, and we entered the lottery system with open minds and hearts. I heard, heard Carol Mineo at the time speak at the Gams Open House and was enamored with her educational vision. As it turned out, Alyssa got her third choice, Gams, but Ms. Mineo retired the summer before she entered public school. Alyssa spent two years at Gams, which turned out to be not a good fit for her. She is a quiet, introverted, and studious child and was lost in the shuffle of a large school. After first grade, we sought to transfer her to a smaller school and considered both horizons and another small school in town of Newburgh. I want to share with you briefly the experiences we had upon visiting those two schools. When visiting the first school, we met the principal who was having lunch with several students in her office because they had been awarded the student of the month title. She asked the children to go around the room and tell us how many times each of them had received that award. It was readily apparent to us that the same students appeared to be honored month after month. It also felt to us like the building was on autopilot going through the same routines that we had for decades, where some kids were simply achievers and many were not. We walked away disheartened from that experience. Our experience at Horizons was quite different. We met Mrs. Vaughn for the first time who introduced us to Mrs. Bennett, the woman who ultimately became Alyssa's second grade teacher. Mrs. Bennett blew us away. We didn't listen to the detractors who said, why do you want your kids to be on the bus for so long? How can you send her to a school that has no brass on the playground? Alyssa and now our son Sam, along with thousands of other children, have and are receiving a stellar, focused, and committed education at Horizons. Mrs. Bennett, who is now retired, was instrumental in advocating for and bringing the IB program to Horizons for all students. This is not a place where some kids receive accolades all, all the time. The monthly IB profile awards are inspirational, where the students nominate each other for exhibiting the learner profiles, showing their peers what traits it takes to become lifelong learners. Despite the high praise that those of us with kids at Horizons give our school, most of my neighbors continue to thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Julia Goings Perot. Sorry, I lost track of which meeting I was signed up to speak for. <laughs> the changes. Um, the, many parents have spoken to you over several months, and again, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you and the dialogue I think we've been able to establish. We appreciate several members of the administration meeting with our compact committee. Uh, information clearly is important. And if I could say personally, I feel empowered 
by learning more about the system and working with my fellow parents. So even though this experience continues to be painful, uh, I appreciate that in comments, we haven't been denigrating other schools. Uh, I think we've had a very mature dialogue um, amongst all the parents and when we leave this building too. So overall, this process has been positive. But again, I would like to echo the comments that we don't want to be in the same place with the potential for infighting year after year, which is inevitable with dwindling resources. So, and uh, I would like to call for a budget committee that would include some parents, maybe not a hundred, but uh, at least an opportunity for us to participate on a more meaningful level and have a dialogue instead of you speaking and then we speak. It's not the same as a dialogue, and I understand how the system is set up this way. But again, I, I think and hopefully you as the board have seen that we, as parents and community members, can engage in a mature dialogue, and we all want what's best for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perez. <laughs> Ms. Heather Christy Robinson. Ms. Meredith Ingram. Not Miss Meredith, but my brother and my husband. In case you guys were confused a bit. Um, I understand you guys have a good decision, depending on what the outcome of the negotiations are. I don't think we need to go into that. Um, I would like to formally announce that I am not running for school board ever, so <laughs> I get it. Um, but what I would like to say is this um, a school closure is emotional because a school closure deals with the kids. That's why emotional pleas are often made. But unfortunately, you can't make an emotional decision. You have to make a decision based on facts. And I think we presented last, was it last Thursday? Thursday? Yeah, sorry. Uh, last Thursday, I think that I think that we bring, we presented some very uh, logical, fact-based reasoning as to why Bongo is not a good school to close. I wish no school had to be closed, but if I had my preference, since my two soon to be three kids are going to Bongo, I would prefer Bongo's not to be closed. Not to say that I want any other school to close. But out of the three, the three schools that have been mentioned, I think Bongo is probably one of the least uh, uh, best choices for closure. Uh, it's got the best academics, as we mentioned, one of the three schools that you guys have you know, said you're doing the right thing. Um, Given that the school's going to be used for office space afterwards, it's just a horrible layout for offices. It's got tons of green space. It's a, it's a cost, uh, it'd be a cost center for you guys if you moved in there. That no one, I mean, I assume you guys aren't going to be using the playground equipment. Um, We're not going to be using space. the building at all, should that oh, okay. come to be. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Um, um, and and you're, we presented like, you know, 20 different, 10, 20 different pieces of information, whether it's the academic stuff, whether it was the cost efficiency of the students, um, you know, we spend less on our students with better, with better results at Bonville, so closing that school would actually have less impact than maybe closing to the other schools. So, at the end, if you look at the facts comparing school to school, and Bonville's making a stronger case as to why not to close it. Uh, hopefully, the negotiations are going to go well. Hopefully, you guys will be able to find that extra, that extra money, um, whether it's through insurance or whatever. Good luck on that. Um, if there's anything we can do to help, I'm sure everyone here would do whatever we can. Um, but short of that, there's a logical case to be made that almost not the right school to close. I'll leave you with that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ingram. Ms. Lee Mansfield. Good evening. My name is Lee Mansfield. I am a taxpayer, a 32 year resident of the city of Newburgh a parent of two NFA grads, a grandparent of two future graduates, and a teacher at Bonneville School for 24 years. I'd like to paint a fuller picture of Bonneville where not only our gardens thrive, but all who enter our doors. It starts with high expectations for all students. Wherever they come from, all students are expected to grow. We've had non-readers enter and grow 16 reading levels in one year. Quiet children bloom into public speakers, and children with poor behavior soften into good citizens. We blend our cultures, ESL, Gen Ed, and Special Ed, into one big family. 
New students and staff are welcomed and included in our purpose to best serve all learning. Bonvel has cross-grade mentorship programs for our children in need of guidance and warm support. The full staff buy-in to 10 years of positive behavioral interventions and supports has rewarded teachers with maximized instructional time and administrators with fewer write-ups and suspensions. Even the bus drivers enjoy their annual appreciation breakfast. Everyone benefits from a more peaceful school. Our random acts of kindness catches children at their best. We have WBEST with daily student broadcasts. We publish student writing in the Bible broadcasts. Students of the month are recognized for their achievements, and I'd like to take you aside to correct a misconception that was presented earlier. The students who were eating with the principal were reporting how many years they've been elected student of the month, not months. They have to wait a whole year to return to that principal's office. Um, we nourish early talent in art, music, and language arts through our enrichment classes. Teachers have produced evening programs in math and science, read across America, first grade reading, cultural celebration, and healthy kids so parents and children can enjoy sharing learning together. Bonneville is the only school this year with a sunrise program to foster critical thinking in preparation for state assessments. The Bonneville Fitness Club is unique in the district. Teachers donate time before school to model the importance of good nutrition and health. Bonneville is known for its charity, the staff gathers donations for families in need, and the children emulate good deeds by filling our holiday food baskets and our giving tree. We support March of Dimes, American Cancer Society, and Leukemia Research. Seeking high-impact, low-cost educational opportunities has knitted Bonneville into the larger community. Veterans of the war reenactors, bad paper pipers, as well as Orange County Departments of Agriculture, Water, and Health have all shared their knowledge. Children hike through Black Rock Forest, gain know-how from master gardeners at the Orange County Arboretum, and see a farm in action at Phillies Bridge. No school deserves to close, and certainly not one with proven success. I thank you for your allowing our voices in these impactful decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Melissa Lamar. I'm Melissa Lamar, 16 years as a parent, 19 years as a taxpayer in this district. In the 90s, class sizes for my older children averaged 20 to 24 students. In 2011, my youngest began in kindergarten with a class size of 27. Smaller class sizes have the greatest effect on graduation rates for low-income minority students. 22% of white students who are not reading proficiently by third grade and live in poverty for at least a year fail to graduate high school. This rate increases to 31% for African American students and 33% for Hispanic students. It is clear that keeping elementary schools, full day kindergarten, and small class sizes must be a priority for our school district. As a Newburgh teacher of eight years, I am hesitant to speak in today's parliament, but the district needs to hear from teachers to ensure the future of public schools. A free and public education with an open door policy for all students is the result of three centuries of progress. Resumes of the government leaders presently informing education at and state and federal levels indicate teaching experience of less than three years on average in charter schools. Dr. Burris, an educator with more than 20 years in public schools, recently testified to Cuomo's commission. She cited research showing that factors other than the teacher account for roughly 85 to 90 percent of the variation in student test scores. This means that evaluations that will be used to rate our district are dependent on a teacher's ability to affect just 10 to 15 percent of score outcomes. The district is forced to pay for these unfunded mandates. Most importantly, our children lose precious educational time. A third grader will spend more than twice as long on the New York State Math and ELA test than seniors do on the SAT. Experienced teachers understand that assessments must be valid and used properly. Teachers have had little to no information from the state to use to justify our formative classroom assessments. Simply, we are being, used to, being asked to measure when our scales do not match. I urge the Board of Education and Administration to hear from your teachers to ensure checks and balances for standardized testing. Let's also come together on funding. The gap elimination adjustment was to last one year when enacted by Patterson. Tax cap legislation and grant regulations take away local public autonomy. 
we must make it clear to Albany that to balance the state budget on the backs of our children by giving up the right to a public education is wrong. There is no more imperative to reduce the deficit at the expense of education. More than one in five children in the U.S. live below the poverty line. Our money should be addressing the true reason for achievement issues. The full impact of public education on a community takes 20 to 40 years to be realized. Political cycles don't last as long, resulting in disastrous short-term planning. We must push back against invalid reforms that promote competition, isolation, and the breakdown of community we are now witnessing. We must refocus government priorities by insisting that experienced voices in public education inform policy. This is about no less than protecting the free and public education. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Chris Renee Lewis. Um, it's an honor to be here this evening. Uh, good evening, board of um, and members. I am once again standing before you pleading as a parent of a special needs child not to close the Bales Gate School. A few months back, I spoke to you in a tear-filled letter I'd written about my son and how he came into this world via a drug and alcohol addicted mother. It was entitled My Story. He was afforded an opportunity to come to Bales Gate School to participate in this program that took him from a special needs school where he learned little to a school where he learned a great deal. Since September, he has done an amazing job. His teacher, Ms. Liberty Byer, aides, therapists, and all that work with him pushed Alex to out to his fullest potential. He is now doing math with no problems and loves science. He loves the nature trail and the playground and comes home with pine cones for me because I love arts and crafts. Alex went to his first dance ever, the Harvest Festival, and came in first place for the most original costume. He was a scarecrow that I made for him. In October, he was student of the month. This little achievement to some people may not be much, but to my son, it was everything. He is confident in his surroundings and has friends in and outside of his own classroom. My son is now playing the drums through private lessons and wants to be a teacher when he grows up. He has never aspired to be anything before. I want to thank the Bales Gate School teachers and students for accepting my son the way he has been accepted. He is not made fun of for being different. Again, I ask, will there be a lottery for the students? Where and how will my son be placed? Will he be sent back to BOCES or AHRC program, where he will learn a little as he did before? I speak for the parents of the children and his predicament who do, not, who do not understand the process, who can't be here due to the work schedules of the parents to keep food and a roof over the heads of their family, and those who do not understand or speak English as there is no interpreter. Where will they go? Back to the sheltered environment of a special needs school? Vail's Gate has opened my son's eyes to the world and what is out there, letting him, letting him know that he does, he does belong. And if I, may, if I may reiterate, my fiance and I have over 50 years experience of working with the physically and mentally disabled population with New York State Hudson Valley DSO. I am proud of my job and the work that I do, and moving a child with special needs will cause progression. Further delays are not an option for my child, as he has learned so much since September. Closing the school is a real heartache for my son. That's why he's not here today. He has gone to have all the meeting, meetings. He cries and he does not want to go to another school. He loves to go to and so do I. Miracle workers is what I call the teachers. Thank you, Mrs. McCormick. <laughs> Ms. Maureen Roche. Mr. Thomas Pupamati. Uh, good evening. Um, speaking of Bell's Gate, just a few important facts to take into consideration are the convenient physical location of the building, the importance of equity in the geographical distribution of schools within the district. It's a nice building with a very large ground for outdoor play, physical activity, and a grant funded nature trail. It also has a large enrollment. Bill's Gate has a lot of programs for students with special needs. There are 85 students in the special education program, approximately 55 of whom are in five self-contained special education classrooms. Two of these classrooms were just added this year, and many of these students received services outside of district previous to this. This would be a great injustice for these children, these particularly vulnerable children, to have to go to a second new school for, in two years. But uh, Bell's Gate also has a large bilingual program. There are approximately 170 English language learners, 100 in bilingual 70 ESL, making up 30% of Bell's Gate's enrollment, one of the largest English language learner enrollments in the district. This is a well-established and successful bilingual program. Bell's Gate has a history of sending very few English language learners into middle schools. They own nearly all of them test out uh, before leaving Bell's Gate. And with New York State Regulation Part 154, 
transfer all these students to other schools, it's very likely that the district may have to create new bilingual programs in other schools in order to comply, which would create huge logistical difficulties to transfer all these students from the English, English, English language learners and special education students into other schools. A lot of associated expenses would then be passed on to other schools, reducing savings. Now, it's so unfortunate that we're forced to battle to keep our excellent schools open, all three excellent schools, and maintain our crucial kindergarten program. We all justify we have a desire to do it to protect our individual schools, but from a larger perspective, all of us, students, parents, teachers, board members, administrators, are really all on the same team. And when we talk about long-term planning, every year it gets worse and worse, and who knows what will happen next year and future years. What school will be next? Because it seems like there'll be another and another and another. That's why we must be proactive and defend our schools now with the same passion and determination that we're showing here before it's too late. It seems like this district, like so many others throughout the state and the country, are coming very close to a breaking point. How many consecutive years can these cuts and closes go on before things are no longer sustainable? And the majority of blame great press with our state and federal policymakers, both elected and appointed. This is happening everywhere. And many of the most important educational decisions on the highest levels have been made by people with little to no experience in education. I would love to know how much our district is forced to spend to implement the new APPR system, common core, and standardized testing. Would that be enough to say of retaining full-day kindergarten programs and maintaining reasonable class sizes in the district. You've got large companies and tycoons making huge profits over these reform initiatives. You've got this in-bloom data program, a joint venture between Bill Gates and Rupert Murdoch, where New York and other states have huge contracts to turn over students' personal academic data to be sold for other companies for marketing purposes. We have a
This unconstitutional educational malpractice will continue. And I'm not sure what the amount translates to a New York budget because I can't find it in four documents, but in North Rockland, a similar demographic, it's $72,636,637 owed to us as of 2013. The commissioner and the governor are not advocates for public education or our children. They are concerned with the New York State contract with Pearson Inc. They are for profit, charter super teams, and the whole district public leader is no capital improvement. Thank you, Ms. Pooley. Ms. Carrie Sussman Torres.
Amanda DeVoice, and I'm a teacher um, at South Middle School. I'm an eighth grade science teacher. Um, thank you for answering some of the points that last, last week when I was um, watching it, I learned a lot from the questions that were posted on the website and the fact that you answered up and helped me. And I believe this helps to streamline the meeting. Currently, the board is considering eliminating the executive director of technology in addition to closing a school. And while I agree, we all agree that we need to find ways to cut costs in education, we have to consider what closing a school will do to the impact of our students. When we look at average class sizes, are we taking into account, into account both special education and more advanced or gifted students that actually have smaller classes? If that is in fact the case, then the general population class sizes will still continue to be larger, giving a false impression of the argument that any cut in education will not impact class size. I ask this because I have students coming to me in the eighth grade that are not at all proficient in reading or math, and some cannot even read a clock that is not digital. When a student is not able to do these basic tasks in eighth grade, there's no solid foundation for students to build upon when moving on to the high school level. It then becomes frustrating for them, and the end expense becomes even greater than would have been necessary had the student had a more solid educational foundation. Currently in my inclusion class has 28 students with almost half the class classified and requiring special accommodations. My honors class has 23 and my other classes have between 22 and 25, which is all manageable numbers until you have a majority of students who cannot read or write at grade level. We're putting teachers on tips, cost tip, on tip, costing more money in so many ways due to administrative costs, teacher anxiety, and telling teachers that it's their fault that students cannot pass the state exam. We're, yet we are not taking consi into consideration the foundation that was not there from the beginning. There needs to be a good solid AIS and math program and reading program. If you're going to increase class size at the elementary level, lay off staff and expect better results. In regards to technology, in our building we currently have one person who teaches hands-on equipment and does some technical support. Eliminating the head of technology, who's going to streamline their process for us, um, and who will be sure we have enough computers when our assessments all are all required to go online. In our building, only sixth graders have iPads, and the rest of the school has to wait and hope that technology will be available to them when doing an assignment and research. Again, who will be in charge of making sure our schools have adequate technology? So when considering a major impact is closing a school or the termination of math and English teachers, please consider the long-term impact rather than the short-term impact. <coughs> Ms. Judy Ambrosetti. Over the course of the budget meetings, we've heard from many individuals who are fiercely proud of and loyal to their schools. Isn't this a wonderful thing? If there's one positive that's come out of these meetings, it's the stirrings of love for Newburgh and the fantastic pro programs that are taking place in Newburgh schools. We've been the brunt of jokes and put downs. The tragedies that have occurred in our city have overshadowed all of the awesomeness. I have a long history with Newburgh and schools. I was born at St. Luke's Hospital. My childhood, took, my childhood took place on South Street, just two blocks up from Montgomery Street School. My dad ran a small variety store there from 1955 to 1976. I used to play on the sidewalk, attend church at St. Mary's. I learned to swim at the Y on Liberty Street. Got my hair cut at Shedden's Beauty School on Chambers Street. Bought bow tie Danish at Esther's, two stores down from Bob's store, and my doctor was Dr. Hillingham on Grand Street. My first encounter with Santa was at Schoonmakers on Water Street. I share these events with you because I've seen the beauty of Newburgh. It is what keeps me here. I've also seen the evil that takes place here. I still live in Newburgh, and the paper tells me every day the atrocities that are taking place because of poverty. Horizons, a.k.a. Montgomery Street, has also seen the ups and downs. My mother-in-law, Min, was the secretary at Montgomery Street School before, during, and after it became a magnet school. When only people from the neighborhood attended, when buses came and transported them out to the suburbs, when people from the suburbs came and lined up in the parking lot to camp for the night to ensure their child got into the gifted and talented school. A tremendous amount of students from Horizons went on to become valedictorians and salutatorians at NFA. They too went to Ivy League schools, military academies, and top universities. 
We became a Blue Ribbon School not once, but twice, because of the hard work of the teachers, administrators, students, and parents. My mother-in-law was also there when every school in the district became a magnet school and parents stopped visiting Horizons. The town schools, once again, were the schools of choice. I know. I've been there. I've been teaching at Horizons for 18 years. I was also a parent of three students who attended our school. Dr. Satterdelli saw the potential for Horizons to again become a school of choice. She was a strong supporter of the accelerated and IB programs. She could have given those programs to any of the other schools in the district. She chose Horizons. We are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Our students are working collaboratively on inquiry. They are using the character education that is so integral to the IB program. We hear kindness and caring. They know they are loved and respected by every adult in their home away from home. As one of my colleagues, John Arreo, said to Mr. Casella, when are we going to break the cycle? The IB program is helping to break that cycle. It is helping the children to see that they are a part of not only the community they see, but one much larger, the world. Our Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Emmy Amanzar. We've been, we've been 
We've been practicing good and everybody was good and our principals, they don't say anything bad and they encourage us to learn more and try our best. And our school also has some things that other schools maybe don't have, like science class, science, math, and uh, computer labs. And, but, and an outdoor classroom that and we can learn more about the environment and nature. Thank you for letting me talk during this night. Thank you very much, Gabriel. And trust me, honey, you wouldn't want to be up here. <laughs> Ms. Billy Cubic Sierra. Hi, I'm Billy. I wasn't sure what I was going to say to you tonight, so forgive me if my thoughts are a little scattered. I do professional fundraising and program development. And one of the first things that I do when I walk into any nonprofit that's struggling is look at their resources. How are they using them? What are they missing? What can we do better? Um, I'd like to introduce you to the solution because you're looking at your best resources right here. I am seeing from every school, not just the ones that they are closing, parents who are getting involved, who are asking questions and looking for answers and trying to provide their own expertise from their own unique points of view to help. And I think that's what we're all here to do. Um, that being said, I am from Horizons. <laughs> but I actually moved to this district, having worked with schools all over the country, because of the school district. Even when people said I was crazy. Even when I had a plan in place to move before my kids got to high school. I have a 20-year-old child who graduated from NFA and a nine-year-old in Horizons right now. My 20-year-old went to Temple Hill, considered one of the most high-risk schools at the moment. She was an honor student all the way through, is brilliant and frustrating and wonderful, and <laughs> gained from her experience. She survived it, and she excelled because and in spite of all of the struggles. But what you're looking at right now are parents with their own unique perspectives and things to offer, ideas, talking about those ideas, brainstorming. That is the only thing that's going to keep us from being back here again and again. I think we have a real gift. We have wonderful, enthusiastic, caring parents and teachers and administrators. And we're here. Ask us your questions. Tell us what you're struggling with. Let us try. Even if our solution seems stupid or uninformed, we're getting there. We're working on it. Let us keep working on it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. I've gone through the list. We have time for two more speakers. So if you'd like to speak, please step to the one of the microphones and give your name and address. I was not going to speak um, for a variety of reasons, but after sitting here tonight and sitting at the last uh, meeting, I felt compelled to. Um, I am a very proud graduate of numerous schools. I graduated from NFA in 1985. Yes, I did just age myself. Um, Newburgh means a lot to me. And growing up, what I remember is the bumper stickers on the back of my parents' cars. Newburgh loves its schools. Sitting here tonight, I still see that love in the audience. And speaking as a parent of two children in this district, I feel compelled to say, of course none of us want to see any school close. I do have to say something on behalf of my children's alma mater. I am no longer a parent at Bongo Elementary School. But the teachers at Bongo made such a huge difference in my children's lives. I feel compelled to tell you about it. I have a son who is a, by some people's standards, a special needs child. He has an IEP, and he went to Bonka. 
He was never in a, a self-contained class. He was always in a regular class. But he had an IEP. And via the cooperation of his kindergarten teacher, someone who I hold very near and dear to my heart, I was able to put my son on the right path. And after that, every teacher um, supported my son's progress. I am very proud to say he is about to enter NFA next year. He receives very little special education services now. He carries about a 90 average at South Middle School in a class, um, which is a regular class, we'll call it. I also have a daughter who, through the special efforts of all the teachers and staff at Bonneville, um, is a very uh, high achieving honor student, and I'm very proud of her. But I'm sure you're going to hear these stories from every school in this district. What I'm asking is when you're thinking about closing a school, if we close one school this year, my understanding is our uh, elementary school classroom size would go from 25 to about 30. Next year, my understanding is there's no doubt in anyone's mind that they're going to have to close, you guys are going to have to close a second school next year. Then that is going to go up to about, what, 35 kids per class? That's unacceptable. Please find a way to whatever cut you're making this year to prevent closing the school next year because that's going to have a huge impact on every child in this district. Newburgh loves its schools. Please continue to remember that. And everybody in this room, I'm sure, is willing to cooperate to make sure that Newburgh continues to live in schools into the next generation. Thank you very much.
a vast amount of input um, from you, not only as teachers or employees within the district, but from parents and community and students. And I want you to know that we all have taken them under consideration and they have been part of us moving forward and making these very difficult decisions that we have before us. I want to ensure you that your voices are being heard and we appreciate the help. We intend to take under careful consideration all of the suggestions that you've been providing to us regarding the possible changes in the budget process moving forward. We've heard you and we will continue to discuss and include but not limit ourselves to the establishment of a budget advisory committee moving forward. Our next meeting will be tomorrow evening. Please note the time change. It will be a special meeting of the board to begin at 6 p.m. here at the NFA main campus auditorium. That will be a special meeting of the board at which time we will have our final discussions and take final consensus on any further reductions that remain to be taken for the 2013-2014 proposed budget. After the discussion and final consensus is taken, there will be, that will be followed by a formal board vote to adopt a budget for the 2013-2014 school budget year. That will be the vote that goes up, the budget that will be provided at the May 21st budget vote, along with the library budget vote and the elections for the Board of Education. So um, we will be posting the change of time, obviously, on the school district's website, but anyone that you know that's planning on attending, if you could please share that information with me. We want to make sure to have the appropriate information out there so that anyone that would like to be here to hear the discussion will have that opportunity. Thank you all very much. We thank you all very much for being here this evening, for your continued respectful behavior and input into this very difficult and grueling process. Be it resolved that the Board of Education provides recesses into executive sessions for the following purpose for the employment history of particular individuals and for collective bargaining of the retailer law for the CSEA, NSAA, and the NTA. The board will not take action after the executive session. Can I have a motion? Roll call, please. Mr. Howard? Yes. 